Our conversation about hospital capacity is often about COVID. This is not COVID, but it is a crisis. Um, our, we're full. We've been 100% capacity for the last two years. Uh, we have an open bed, it gets filled. It's making it harder to save the lives of kids in trouble. He was a professor in Colorado who tried to use the Constitution to overturn American democracy. Now he's using it to avoid answering questions about it. A school determined to prove that language learning can go both ways at once. To see them take ownership of the language uh, has, been, has been really encouraging. And restoring Colorado's plains using bison and what they do. That's next. Colorado's ICU capacity so dominates our conversations about whether people can go to the hospital and get care if they need it. We can lose sight of what is really a parallel capacity crisis these days. Psychiatric beds for young people. The pediatric mental health care system in our state is beyond crisis. Here's Steve Steger. Our system has been really was at capacity prior to the pandemic and the pandemic has just made things really, really uh, uh, worse. It's no secret that kids are struggling. Jason Williams sees that struggle in real time every day. We're full. We've been 100 percent capacity for the last two years. Uh, we have an open bed. It gets filled. Williams heads the Pediatric Mental Health Institute at Children's Hospital Colorado. His numbers are only for children's, but they speak volumes for the entire system in our state. Since the start of the year, between 15 to 40 visits to the emergency department each day at Children's are kids in a mental health crisis. At one point, it was the number one reason kids were ending up in the ER there. From the start of the year to mid-October, there have been more than 5,000 emergency department visits for behavioral health um, across our system. I described it at one point as a tsunami that hadn't hit the shore. Uh, and we were waiting for this, this wave. Um, and the tsunami has now hit multiple waves. Their feeling of isolation, loneliness, not belonging. And it, in Denver in particular, the suicide rates for young people are twice the nation's average. Dr. Carl Clark leads the Mental Health Center of Denver. He says the pandemic is pushing kids to the brink, but he also says that solutions are on the table. There are a lot of early intervention programs where we work with young people to learn about, you know, dealing with stress, uh, dealing with connections. Children's is actually using the crisis as momentum for change. The curse and the blessing of COVID is the need for behavioral health interventions has never been higher. But elected officials are seeing this and hearing this, you know, from their constituents. And so there's tremendous will from Democrats and Republicans at the local level, the state level, the federal level. And Dr. Clark says a well-meaning piece of public policy years ago might have contributed to some of the stress on the system. There was a push to keep kids out of residential psychiatric facilities and keep them in home care. And that meant a lot of residential facilities closed. So in some cases where a kid might be beyond needing hospital care, but still needs some extra care, Kyle, they're staying in the hospital for a bit longer and mm -hmm. they're taking up those beds that maybe someone who just needs to get into the hospital for hospital care actually might need. This is a moment in this country where we're prepared to spend some money and take some time to fix things that don't work right in the health care system. What are the chances that can extend to this problem? So Colorado has a task force right now looking at how to spend about $450 million children's hospital pushing to try to take a third of that, which represents about the population of Colorado, about a third of the population are young people and mm. invest that into systems to try to fix this problem. It's been around for a long time. Yeah. The difference this time around is that people are actually willing to talk about it. Sure, and we know the toll that the last two years has taken on kids especially. Steve, thank you. It's really encouraging that we see our COVID patient count dropping this week. 1,368 patients are currently in Colorado's hospitals with COVID-19. That is down 32 patients from the day before, down 136 from this time last week. The test positivity rate which is our measure of how freely the virus is spreading the community is being really stubborn. We hope that that would get below 9% this week. It hasn't happened. In fact, our seven day moving average has ticked up a bit. It's now at 9.25%. Former CU professor John Eastman used the United States Constitution for something other than subverting democracy today. The man who outlined the Trump team's plan to overturn the election pleaded the fifth to avoid answering questions about it. Eastman was subpoenaed by the House Select Committee that's investigating the January 6th insurrection. 
Eastman wrote the memo outlining a six-step process on how Vice President Mike Pence and Republicans could throw out the election results and keep President Trump in power. Pence refused to do it, and American democracy survived. Eastman was a visiting scholar for the Benson Center for the Study of Western Civilization at CU Boulder. The university stripped him of his public duties as a visiting scholar back in January after he spoke at President Trump's Stop the Steal rally. That was the big gathering that preceded the march of Trump supporters who later stormed the U.S. Capitol. Eastman is no longer affiliated with CU. Language learning tends to kind of flow in one direction. Know one language, then learn another. A school in Commerce City is trying an approach that has some cross currents. You've got Spanish speakers learning English alongside English speakers learning Spanish. Our Victoria de Leon takes us inside an approach that's rooted in equity. In classroom 21 at DuPont Elementary, learning goes beyond subjects and explores bilingualism and biculturalism. And having grown up in this community, I wanted to come back to have representation for the students because, you know, I, I grew up just like them. This is Fernanda de Luna's first year teaching a two-way dual language class where students learn equally in English and Spanish. Okay. Last year I was teaching in the bilingual program, but it was still one way. Um, so it was mostly, it was students who um, spoke mostly Spanish. Yeah. Our students whose first language was Spanish were coming here, they were learning the fundamentals <coughs> of reading, writing, and math in Spanish, and then eventually transitioning over uh, to English. And so it was a one-way model. Principal Brian Clark says at least 60% of their students are already second language learners. In August, DuPont became the first school in the Adams 14 district to apply the new learning model. What uh, we have found here in the, in the northern part of Commerce City is that uh, our, you know, our community is really uh, interested in this programming, providing bilingual education for their students, and um, you know, understanding what our communities need is, is paramount here and meeting their needs is in, in an equitable, equitable way. Aside from the academic and cognitive benefits that come with being bilingual, I think it's important to be able to connect with students culturally and linguistically. The Luna is most proud of the connections made because of it. It recognizes who they are and it makes them feel seen um, within an education system that may have otherwise um, not. See, not recognize them fully uh, for all of their strengths and all of uh, the wonderful things that they are bringing in. So there are only about a dozen districts in the entire state that offer dual language immersion, but different schools have different models. So Kyle, for some, that means learning one language more than the other. But at DuPont, the program is only available for pre-K to kindergarten students. They plan to expand that so that students are fluent in both languages by the time they graduate from the fifth grade. And, and their hope is that this is something that not only can be transformational for those kids, but might also be for their district. Yeah, absolutely. So the principal says they want to eventually move into a model where students can take their state assessments in the language that they're stronger in. He says that would probably be a more equitable approach mm. and could improve their overall assessment scores. Because remember, Commerce City is um, an area in Colorado where they have a really uh, significant Hispanic Latino population. Yep, and a, a district that has been struggling to improve test scores and, right. and find ways to best serve that community. Really interesting right. stuff. Thank you, Victoria. A rancher is using bison to restore Colorado's prairies. The secret is in the belly of the beast. And converting abandoned newspaper stands into a new way to spread knowledge around town. Next. A festive Friday night in downtown Denver. However, no snow, no snow on the ground and really no major snow inside another above average kind of day with highs in the lower 60s out of DIA 50s in northern Colorado and across the eastern plains and pretty comfortable up into the mountains again tonight on HD Doppler 9 tough to find any clouds out there. Temps falling into the 20s and 30s across the state. High pressure is around, so that's going to keep us mild tomorrow, but a cold front on the way will swing in on Sunday that cools us off slightly and all
also helps to kick up the winds. Daytime highs back in business with the 60s for your Saturday afternoon. Haven't put up the holiday decor. Tomorrow, the day to do it. A little cooler, windy on Sunday. Right now, seasonal on Monday. Isolated snow showers coming our way Tuesday with a better chance next Friday. 276 Fridays worth of your good news around here, and I'm not close to tired of it. Our Tom Cole set out today with his camera and our favorite question, putting the headlines of your life on our television station. What's your good news? It's actually really pretty outside today. It's really beautiful weather, and the leaves falling from the trees are really pretty. We're waiting between sessions of our swim meet so we just decided to go in the back of the truck my good news is that the school semester is almost over and i'm almost in christmas break and i got me a new job my handsome son got me the job i'm real proud my good news is i'm getting a new phone my good news is to have a baby boy Good news is hard to come by nowadays, unfortunately. But good news, I mean, we're surrounded <laughs> by children. Children are good news. <laughs> he is only three months, so this is one of our good news for our family. My good news is, is that I have my first fundraiser for my nonprofit, Nikki's Place, tomorrow night. We are helping children who are aging out of the foster care system. So former foster children, mentoring children going through that right now. My man Simba here, nice pit bull, rare breed, you know, he's a little dysfunctional, but still love him. Good news, good news that's going on right now in my life is I'm a realtor. I just passed my real estate exam, got both my license, so yeah, I'm ready to get into the real estate world and make some real money. Am I talking to like a, an athlete going to the Olympics or something? Hey, yes, 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 you are indeed, actually. Running wise, uh, after I get back from my injury, just go out there, perform to the best of my ability. It's like the best icebreaker question of all time. What's your good news? You get all these fascinating insights into people's lives. Our thanks to photojournalist Tom Cole for that. Empty newspaper stands of some once proud newspapers are kind of a sad symbol of how journalism has changed. Did make us smile, though, to see how some of those stands are being repurposed in Westminster. Nikki Beefel has been converting old abandoned news racks at RTD stops into those little free libraries. You know those things. She uses light rail to commute, and she noticed that their old newspaper boxes were empty and unused. Thought they could make pretty good bookshelves. So she put in little free libraries at newsstands at stops at Westminster, the US 36 and Sheridan Park and Ride, and at three other RTD stops around Adams County. Each one of the little free libraries can hold hundreds of books. I, I'm a fine artist, and any time I can take that moment to make the world more beautiful, I will do that. The bus stations and the train stations are beautiful on their own. RTD has an excellent art budget and, and finds wonderful artists to do murals and sculptures at their stations. And this was just a part that hadn't been touched yet. How about that? Libraries is art. The goal is to make those little free libraries permanent. What they need now is for people who pass them to put some books inside. Good ranching and, and farming requires you to really look down and look down at the ground and see what are the grasses doing. Looking down also keeps you from stepping in bison pies. Those two are part of the solution to refresh Colorado soil. That's next. Colorado's grasslands were once under hoof of some of the 50 million bison roaming the American plains. When the bison were killed off, the plains also changed. There's a ranch here trying to heal the relationship between the grass and grazers. Here's Corey Reppenhagen. Being out here on the short grass prairie, seeing bison just grazing about, I mean, it just, it just resonates somewhere in your DNA where your body's like, yeah, this is right. This is how it used to be. Bobby Gill helps manage this 7,000 acre bison ranch near Strasburg. He's not just a rancher, he's also a researcher. And this land is a science project run by the Colorado-based Savory Institute. And what we're doing here at this ranch is showing that grassland regeneration is possible, that it is possible to have grazing herbivores, livestock on a piece of land, grazing in a way that improves the health of the land. Gill says these bison don't just walk the soil, they're part of the soil. 
For example, the dirt is dusty and dry in this time of severe drought, but he says the water necessary for the growth and decay of grass can be found in the belly of these beasts. And the only place that you'll find above ground out here where you have year round available moisture is in that fourth stomach, the rumen of the livestock. He says the special stomachs of grazing animals like bison have the ability to regenerate soil health. What's good for the bison going in is good for the soil coming out. But ultimately what we want is we want this piece of manure to be broken down and fully reincorporated back into the ground. At this ranch, the amount of grass each herd eats and the amount of time each field needs to recover has been pre-calculated. Gill says the right balance between grazing and growing will regenerate this soil. He says it's a balance that was once handled by Mother Nature. Predators like gray wolves used to keep the herds moving at just the right pace. So now we come in as humans and we essentially take the place of the predators. So instead of wolves circling around them and causing them to move about, now we subdivide a ranch into pastures and we move them from one pasture to the next. And he says this method of soil regeneration is not just a trend, it's a permanent solution. This isn't just one thing that's happening in this small little microcosm right here. This is this big, huge, massive movement of land managers who are seeing that there's a better way of doing things. Meteorologist Corey Reppenhagen for next. He also said the best way for consumers to support the regeneration of grassland is by looking for the land to market logo on products. Back with a sign of confusion. That confusion is probably all mine. That and the meaning behind this jacket. Some old time next viewers might just remember. It's a sign offering help that you didn't know you needed. Norvin was in Denver when he passed this van. Side there says, AAA batteries delivered and installed. I don't know, I'm, I'm pretty confident about changing the AAA batteries in my TV remote and such. It's honestly, guys, the car batteries and such that I'm not confident with. If there's a van that travels around and helps with car batteries, that seems like it would be a more useful service uh, than just helping with the, the AAAs. I, I may be missing something here. It's possible it's going over my head. Send us the signs that catch your eye. Snap a pic and email it to next at 9 newscom or use the hashtag HeyNext on Twitter. If you have watched Next for years and if you have a highly discerning eye for various plaids and window panes and houndstooth, you might recognize this jacket. It belonged to Doyle Larson, a Next viewer who passed away four years ago tomorrow. His wife, Connie, used to joke with Doyle that the jacket was so ugly that only I would wear it, and she decided to bring it down to the TV station after Doyle passed away. We used this jacket to start a conversation about love and loss around the holiday time. And it was then that a bunch of us made donations to brain cancer research in Doyle's memory. It was really kind of like Word of Thanks microgiving before Word of Thanks even existed. And then hundreds of you wrote in to Doyle's wife, Connie, these beautiful messages about grief and heartbreak and the holidays. Doyle's jacket, Doyle's immensely ugly jacket, is our annual reminder here this time of year that some of our hearts are not whole at the holidays, but that remembering what made loved ones laugh might make us laugh again. And doing something special, even something small, can help bring their memories close. Feedback tonight for the next team from Kathleen Kane, who writes, Informative, humorous, compassionate. Thank you, that is very kind. Josh Lawrence writes, I don't like Kyle Clark, but I love his heart. Assuming that's not some odd reference to human sacrifice, uh, I appreciate it, and I'll see you next time.